My name is Fernando Bermudez, pleased and honored to be in your beautiful country, Deutschland. <laughs> the Bavarian Hills, the beautiful village from which we came from, so peaceful and beautiful. Getting justice is the title of my lecture. Getting justice is something that I, Fernando Bermudez, and my long-suffering family, my wife, my parents, my defense team, and so many people who cared about the truth suffered for. Getting justice was something so extremely difficult to achieve, which is why it's an added honor to be here today. In the summer of 1991, my life was full of promise. My family and I, as I lived in New York City, Upper Manhattan, Washington Heights, a predominantly Dominican neighborhood of people from the Dominican Republic in the Caribbean, shared an American dream. My parents immigrated from the Dominican Republic and came here in search of a better life after civil problems in the country. Along with myself, my three brothers, and my sister, my parents sought to educate us. They sought to bring a better life for us by sacrificing and sharing the mystic optimism that immigrants all have when they come to America. The melting pot that people from all over the world come to America for in terms of having a better life. But on that summer of August 6, 1991, my life was shattered into pieces that I have yet to pick up. Shattered with the rudest awakening of my life as a gun was placed to my head and detectives surrounded me. I was shocked. My brother, who got out the car with me, formed a perfect yawn of shock. And I couldn't believe it as my mind just got all confused when I was shown my picture. They said, the detectives, is this you? I said, yeah. Well, you're coming with us. And so I'm handcuffed. Handcuffed with handcuffs that are so tight they feel like tourniquets. They were stopping my circulation. And I get placed in the police car with two detectives, one whose complexion looked like pepperoni pizza, another one who had wings of silver salt and pepper hair with a Bostonian accent. And he said, let's move this car, we got business. And so we drove on the highway, the Henry Hudson Highway in Upper Manhattan, the equivalent of my New York Autobahn. And we were racing to the police precinct. Why am I in the precinct? I ask. And I'm handcuffed, sitting down. And they tell me, you should know. You're in the Greenwich Village section of Manhattan. And you're here because a crime has been committed in the Greenwich Village section of Manhattan. Why? Well, I don't know anything about it. Well, why don't you tell me where were you on the night of August 3rd and 4th, 1991? He tells me in my face. I remember. It was just two days ago. On that night in question, I was celebrating my enrollment in college, set to enter the medical profession that fall until the summer canceled my classes in the worst way. Yeah, yeah, tell us more. I'm with my friends, I emphasize. 
And under no circumstances were we involved in any violence. Did we go to any nightclub called the Mark Ballroom? And no, I don't know who Ephraim Lopez is. Street named Pito. I don't know this person. Well, do you have a name that you go by on the street? Yes, my nickname is Most. That was my graffiti name, my artist name. And then the prosecutor comes in. The prosecutor with a mean, persistent attitude, angry about the fact that I am not telling the detective anything more. And I say the same thing over and over again. Hours are passing by in the police precinct. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I want to go home. And for the last time, I emphasize where I was on that night in question. The medieval Germans had a proverb that says, Schatt, Stadt, Luft, Mach, Frei. The city air will set you free. The city air had now had me arrested. I was not free. I wasn't going anywhere. As I persisted in my story, having enjoyed that evening, driving through 42nd Street, looking at the kaleidoscope of culture, of so many different people, the neon signs of 42nd Street and Times Square blurring with colorfulness and happiness in my heart. And yet, it doesn't matter. Because now, I'm told to sit down in a lineup. And if I do, I can call my mother. I don't realize that by all accounts, by all accounts according to documented evidence in the court, Ephraim Lopez, Pito, had been punched in a nightclub in the Greenwich Village section of Lower Manhattan. Embarrassed, he wants revenge. And he tells his friends from the West 90s neighborhood where he lives, who all came to the nightclub together, who punched him. Outside the nightclub, Ephraim Lopez and his friends follow Raymond Blount and his friends. On the corner of 13th and University Place, they confront each other, almost like a scene from the West Side Story. And bottles are thrown, fists fly, a jeep blocks escape as people try to run away. And in the confusion of that nighttime condition, a shot rings out, echoing, ricocheting, and striking not just Raymond Blount, dead, but me, unwittingly, unaware that my life is about to turn upside down. Ephraim Lopez is arrested because the teenage witnesses who had been beat up, who were punched, had been placed in a police precinct for many hours. They were hungry, tired, traumatized. They were even stabbed. And they were placed in an illegal identification procedure in which they were sitting in a table about this size and they were sitting on one side to the other side and they were allowed to look through pictures. They're looking at pictures of people who they believe might be the person responsible for the shooting. A 17 year old young lady selects my picture as her third selection of someone who looks like the person. She takes my picture illegally against the law and shares it with other witnesses. You're not supposed to do that because there's a psychological process that happens in which because one witness says that, yeah, he looks like the person, then it kind of reinforces. It provides further belief that they are making the right decision. They got it wrong, very wrong. But what they got right, however, 
was the identification before my identification, misidentification, which is the leading cause of why people end up in prison. What they got right was the identification of Ephraim Lopez. That's because three friends of Raymond Blount, who were standing right next to him when he was shot, said, I wasn't the person. But they correctly identified Ephraim Lopez. They said, this is the guy who got punched and why the fight began. Those three witnesses are taking out the police room. And the other witnesses are allowed now to discuss more photographs, which is how my picture gets misidentified. Now, the police know that out of these seven witnesses, the person who is described as the shooter stands 5'10", 165 pounds. At the time, in 1991, I'm 6'2", weighing 220 pounds. And I'm a serious bodybuilder at the time. I eat every two hours. I lift weights for two hours a day, five to six days a week. That's why they tell me to sit down in a lineup. A lineup is a process in which suspects are identified through a glass in which I can't see them, but they can see me. I'm told to sit down and get a number. So I sit down with five other people. And these people are police officers. I know this because they're not only in civilian clothing, but more importantly, they have ball bearing beads, which underneath their t-shirts, you can see the badges if you look close enough. This is not going right. This is getting worse. It seems like I have a bullseye and they're shooting right at me because it's obvious that I'm the only person who is having a bad day. Really. And so now they say that I've been identified by these witnesses, these teenage witnesses, and I appear before a judge. And I tell a judge upon my arraignment, which is a process under American law in which you plead guilty or not guilty and the case goes forward. And I say, not guilty. And as a result of this, I'm sent to Rikers Island because the prosecutor files an unclaga, which is the equivalent of an American indictment in my case. And as a result of this, my das Ferebrechen, in terms of long detention, because I am charged with murder, begins at Rikers Island. I arrive at Rikers Island, handcuffed. I have to await my trial now because I said I'm not guilty. Getting justice is getting complicated. Getting justice means that because I don't have money to put bail, because my family is poor, I now have to stay in prison because I'm not rich. So off to prison I go. Old Bailey, as they say in England. And Rikers Island is a place of 14,000 prisoners. That's 4,000 more, correct me if I'm wrong, than this university's population of 10,000 or so, I believe, according to my studies. And there's a lot of angry people in there, angry. And I'm just trying to survive. I'm trying to be invisible because I'm scared. When I get there and the handcuffs are taken off, my clothing is stripped off. And I hear, I'm saying, uh-oh. Uh oh, and I'm standing there naked, and all this 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 gallery of cells about from here to the back of the wall are people locked up, standing waiting to get beds because in Rikers Island you have to wait sometimes up to 24 hours to get a place to sleep. So I'm there now, getting ready to join this holding cell, and all these men are waiting, angry, and yet somebody whistles, 
I get my bed. And I start trying to survive in Rikers Island. And I start witnessing some of the most horrible things I've ever witnessed in my life. People are cutting each other, stabbing each other. There's gangs walking around trying to control two, cell, two phones for a place where prisoners are housed of about 80 people. And for that phone, everybody's fighting. You have people trying to control that phone. And gangs are controlling black market operations, calling and using it for drugs to have their girlfriends bring in drugs. And there's officers beating up prisoners and prisoners attacking officers. And all along, I'm trying to read. And I'm getting physically attacked. If I fight somebody, I get jumped. And I don't want to fight. I'm not a violent person. I'm just trying to survive. I'm trying to survive because getting justice to me at this point means truth plus patience will equal freedom. That's what I believe. It's the American dream. It's what I, in America, placed my hand on my heart and pledged the Pledge of Allegiance to. It's what I grew up believing. And so I go to trial and my trial is complicated because not only am I there as a prisoner and I have no way of really defending myself as if I were free, but unknown to me by all accounts, again, proven in the record, as pointed out in the introduction of this talk, the witnesses were exposed to misconduct. And this misconduct began, one, not just by the bad identification procedures in which the witnesses shared the picture, but two, right after that happened and my case was going to trial, then two of the witnesses were offered a deal in which they had been arrested before, all the witnesses had been arrested before, unrelated to this case, just trouble with the law, shoplifting, gun charge, a number of things. So they've been in trouble, these teenagers. And two of the witnesses, as a result of prosecutor James G. Rodriguez offering them a deal in which if they told lies against me, their charges would be dropped, decided to testify against me. They decided to tell lies. Now, Ephraim Lopez is the most interesting witness. Let's just call him the third witness for now out of the two I just mentioned. And he's the most interesting witness, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because he demonstrates under law, American law, what's called proving motive. Proving motive is describing the idea why a witness, or I should say, a person involved in a crime would commit that crime. What pushed him to do that? Why? Well, Ephraim Lopez describes it very clearly to police on August 5th, a day before my arrest when he's interrogated with police officers and the prosecutor. He tells them that the person responsible for the crime is an individual named Wu Lu. And that Wu Lu lives in his neighborhood. He's an area drug dealer. And as we later find out, because we have to make our own investigation as part of getting justice, Wu Lu is his roommate. So they have a reason to defend themselves. So here you have this odd couple, right, becoming odder because Ephraim Lopez is not arrested. In fact, he's offered a deal in which if he decides to falsely testify against me and say that I'm Wulu, then he'll get out of prison. He won't get charges to murder as an accessory. So Ephraim Lopez now also testifies against me. And I can't believe it. He's at trial, this 16-year-old, up until that point, career criminal, because on the night in question, he had been to prison and was on a special release program and had not followed his curfew, meaning he wasn't supposed to be outside that night. But yet he was, and look what happened. Look at the trouble that happened. And so Ephraim Lopez is testifying, saying, do you see the defendant, the person responsible for the shooting in the courtroom? And he goes... That's him. And he says, I'm Wu Lu. I'm not Wu Lu. My street name is Most, as a graffiti artist, as I pointed out. 
And the police know this. And they know that my physical description doesn't match what they have been told by all the witnesses, including Ephraim Lopez himself, who knows this person. It's like as the trial unfolds, he's like a Pinocchio. And his nose is growing and growing and growing. So much so that I'm here and he's there and I could almost touch his nose. You lie. You liar. But the thing is, I'm not laughing. I'm actually starting to almost cry. Because I take the stand and I testify. My friends who were with me on the night in question and came to the police precinct before I knew I was charged with murder testify on my behalf. We were never there. We don't know what you're talking about. In fact, Raymond Blount's friends, his best friends, who would want justice? If your best friend was killed, I'm sure you would want justice for that person, even though he's dead. But his three friends don't come to testify against me. They come to testify for me and say that I'm not the guy because the guy that they saw was much skinnier and shorter. I'm found guilty. I'm found guilty. And as the jury comes back with that verdict, we, the people of the state of New York, find the defendant, Fernando Bermudez, guilty of second degree murder. I can't believe it as my mother cries, as my father gets up and tells the prosecutor, you're the only criminal in this courtroom and the truth will prevail. At which point the prosecutor says that he needs bodyguards. Now, now he's scared for his life. Just because my family is crying, just because my parents love me, just because they want to get justice. And I see my little sister who is six years old at the time and she's crying on the floor and I'm taken away in handcuffs and I'm crying. From Rikers Island, which I survived after over a year, now I'm sent to upstate prisons. And it feels like my identity is leaving me. Fernando Bermudez has now become prisoner number 92-8325. My head is shaven. My clothes are stripped again. And I'm given a green prison uniform. I'm entering an American gulag, so to speak, in that now I enter a prison system in which people are serving many, many, many years for murder, for serial murder, for killing police officers, for rape, for sex with dead people. Any number of things that you can think of that are horrible and make society unsafe are my neighbors. These are my neighbors. These are the guys who I have to live with now in cells. And I'm overwhelmed because the cells, when I enter the penitentiary, populate thousands of people with cells as, as high as four stories high. And each one has cells and people are fighting and yelling and killing themselves. The correctional officers are carrying people because I guess they just couldn't take it. They had to take what Ernest Hemingway, the American writer, called the big way out in terms of suicide. I had to fight against all of this. I had to reject the delusions, the mind that was quickly becoming my worst enemy from convincing me to kill myself in ways that I started thinking about doing it in my cell. In ways that I saw an imaginary rope hanging out from a light thing. I had to fight that because my parents loved me. I had to fight that because getting justice meant persevering. It meant that now I was in for a fight that was more like a marathon, not a sprint. And for which, if I didn't get strong, I was going to die in that place because I had a life sentence. I was sentenced to 23 years to life, which meant that even after 23 years, there was no guarantee that I was gonna be released. I had a life sentence, meaning I could die in prison. So I started learning the law. I started educating myself. 
I started trying to do what I could in terms of creating hope for myself. Hope, you will see in this story, is a driving force for any of us. Hope is what allows us to see something which can become better when it just seems so bad. I found comfort before I ever knew the words of Friedrich von Schiller, who said, lose not yourself in a far off time, seize the moment that is thine. I had to see beyond the moment of imprisonment. And so I started educating myself. I started learning the law. I started seeing that I had to learn the law to get out of prison and I started writing letters. An attorney started answering my cries. I got an attorney from Westchester who had just become an attorney in 1991. I became her first case. She was imprisoned in Russia by the KGB. And when she got out of prison, she said, I am going to become a lawyer to help people when I get back to America. And so she earned a law degree in her late 40s. And she stood five feet tall with big blonde hair. And she had this voice that sounded like she inhaled helium, almost like Mickey Mouse. And yet, she could run real fast with these high heels. And she had the courage and faith of a Joan of Arc after she was introduced by a German judge retired in America who my father met because we didn't have any money for an attorney. And my father was always looking for people to help me. He worked in a parking garage up until his retirement. And he found this former German judge. I don't know if he was an American or in Germany, but this man introduced us to Mary Ann DeBarry. And Mary Ann DeBarry found all the evidence that could have freed me by 1994, when in fact, this case should not have gone that far because the police and prosecutor, by their own admission at my trial, admitted to not ever investigating what Ephraim Lopez told them. That's why I want to stress to you the importance of an investigation in the case. What the prosecutor and the detectives had allowed themselves to fall victim to, as well as their own evil and their own misconduct, was what's called, in American legal terms and psychology, tunnel vision. Tunnel vision is that psychological problem when law enforcement, or anyone really, just sees straight ahead and they don't see information coming at them from the side the way it was, Ephraim Lopez telling them, Wu Lu. Or the other witnesses, no, the guy was too big. Or I'm not sure it was him at all. Or I was drinking, like one of the witnesses says, so I'm really not sure. They ignored all of that. And so it seemed to me that I would be going home despite these problems that happened and could have prevented my case. Marianne appears before the judge and she presents evidence of all the witnesses, four witnesses and Ephraim Lopez being the fifth witness who knows who committed this crime, indicating that Wu Lu was actually the shooter and the judge refuses to hear it. He doesn't care. So I start losing appeal after appeal, despite Mary Ann having found this evidence. The only case against me, ladies and gentlemen, is again the biggest problem of why people land in prison as innocent people, and that is mistaken eyewitness identification. There is no physical or forensic evidence linking me to this crime. I even took a lie detector and passed. So it's a problem here. It's a problem that's developing and getting worse and worse. Now, 1999 rolls around. And it's a new millennium. And the prison is an uproar. People believe that it's the end of the world. They start thinking because 2000 is about to happen. So superstitious prisoners are talking about, are they here yet? Have they come? In prison, again, your mind can become your worst enemy. 
And I fight this by continuing to fight and learn the law because now I have lost a majority of my appeals. My next hope is in federal court. And I have to go into federal court and attack my appeal based on that my wrongful conviction was against the United States Constitution of America. But I don't have any money again. I have no money. How can I afford an attorney? The attorney that we paid for my trial and lost was an immigration and divorce attorney, which my parents heard about just by word of mouth because they were desperate and needed an attorney. They picked him because he spoke Spanish, even though he wasn't Spanish, and because he had a son named Fernando. And I guess they believed, well, if he has a son, Fernando, he'll really fight. But in fact, specializing in divorce, he did just that. He helped me get divorced from society. And so we get an attorney who charges us $15,000 to take my case at that point in 1999. My parents have to take out a loan. And I myself have to do something because my parents can't afford $15,000. Nobody's willing to give them all that money. What I begin doing is employing my business principles in a productive way because by now I have earned an associate's degree in prison. So I use my business skills in a good capitalistic sense and I start buying clothing on the street wholesale and I start retailing it. What's pushing me here is love. The love of my wife who is suffering so much throughout my incarceration. We have a daughter, and my daughter wants to reach her 15th birthday, which in Latino America, Latin America tradition is called the quinceta, and an American is the sweet 16. And she's growing older, and she wants me to come home. And as the years pass by, we have more children. And I have to sell clothes. The clothing that I buy, that she helps me buy, costs a shirt, for example, can cost $5, and I sell it for $20 to help support the family. I don't get money. Instead, I get toothpaste, soap, detergent, anything they sell in the prison store. And when I have my private visits with her, she's able to get bags of it. Because in, in New York State Prison, you're allowed three private days on the prison grounds in like a house, even though it's surrounded by barbed wire fences and gun towers. And she takes all these groceries from the prison store, which I get in exchange for the clothing, and she sells it in the stores out in the world for actual money. By this method, we pay the rent. When my children need a bike for Christmas, they have a bike. And I save enough money to help pay the attorney. We go to court, federal court, on November 7th, 2002. The year when my second daughter turns one years old. And I'm believing that this is a good sign because my daughter is one years old. For the first time, a different judge has ordered all the witnesses to come forward into court to reveal why they lied, etc. To me, it's a good sign that I'm going home. The witnesses all come forward and reveal the reasons why they lied. And I believe something is about to change. In fact, Ephraim Lopez, the state star witness who knows who committed the crime, shuffles by me in handcuffs because he's been arrested in a 10-year time since I've been locked up for unrelated cases again and again and again. And he shuffles by me in handcuffs and he goes, I'm so sorry for what I did to you. And the guards take him off, come on, come on, let's move, let's move. And my lawyers who are Jewish turn around and say, Fernando, what do you think about that? 
And I say, I forgive them in the name of Jesus Christ. And because they're Jewish and they don't believe, they say, whatever. <laughs> but for me, ladies and gentlemen, I have lifted a burden. It's like I have vomited after too much drinking. Oh, I felt good. It's like I finished a run many miles. And now I just finished and you got that good feeling. Ah. You know, that's how I felt because I had released a burden that was bothering me. For years, I had hated these people. I was thinking uh, Edmund Dante in the Count of Monte Cristo, you know, to get the prosecutor, to get the witnesses. An Edgar Allan Poe type of story in the cask of Amontillado. Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing it right. In which the person who he wanted revenge against, was brought down a wine cellar in Edgar Allan Poe's and buried behind the wall. So he was like, what happened? That's what I wanted. I wanted revenge. But now I got a chance to let it go. And I was becoming a free man, even though I was in prison, in ways that I didn't believe. It felt good to do that. And I dare say it could feel just as good when whenever somebody does to you, something bad to you, that you can forgive, that you can let it go. You don't have to forget what happened, but you can forgive. Because when you do so, you relieve the power that somebody who did something bad against you has over you. You release that power. You kick it in the ass. And that's what I had to do. I had to keep kicking, not just with forgiveness, but for getting justice. Especially because by 2004, the judge denied my appeal. Didn't matter that my daughter was now three years old. Didn't matter. It didn't matter that now I had lost 10 appeals and that meant that I could probably stay in prison for the rest of my life if something different didn't happen. Ten appeals, ladies and gentlemen. The odds of me winning another appeal after this, being denied in federal court, were like winning a lottery. Very, very difficult. And painstakingly difficult as well. I had to now survive the idea of what was I going to do next. Prison life continued. I'm living in a six by nine foot cell year after year. Six by nine foot cell, what I mean by that is it's this big. I can touch the walls and it's this long to the end of this table. That's it. And there's a sink, there's a toilet right next to the sink. There's a hard bed that feels like a cement tomb. And there's roaches everywhere, Ferrari fast, which I have to try to fight against. There's so much noise. There's people getting burned in their cells. Could be a rapist because in prison, a rapist is considered one of the worst type of prisoners. If you are charged, innocent or not, and of course, it's even worse if you're innocent and you're charged with rape, then you are looked upon like the lowest of the lowest human being in prison. And there will be people looking for revenge to get you as if some sort of vigilante squad. And people actually got burned in their cells. The men would come by with something fiery and throw it in. And if you don't get out, you're gonna die in there. Or they'll burn your cell so that when you come back, you can't come back and they have to move you off where all the other prisoners are. So I have to survive all of this. I have to survive individuals like Officer Murphy, otherwise known by the prisoners as Officer Marshmallow. Officer Marshmallow, let's stay with that name, is an individual who weighs about 400 pounds. And when he walks, with his keys all moving, he puts his stomach his big stomach, and he puts it like on the thing, and he puts it, his thing. Oh, so what are you going to do? And he's looking at you with one eye. Just one eye. He got like one eye. I don't know what's wrong with this eye. It just doesn't open. 
And he's like this. What do you want? And Officer Marshmallow acts like a, a, a correctional guard who, as a child, never received toys. Maybe that's what's bothering him. I don't know. But Officer Marshmallow got problems. He wants to make life miserable for everybody. He wants to go in your cell and look around and he wants to look at every little thing to see if he finds something. And then he'll sneak on the gallery. I'm in my cell reading. It could be Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. It could be Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. And it seems by now that getting justice means that I have to read War and Peace about five times. That's how long it seems that I've been in prison for already. Because in prison, 24 hours seems like 48. Because time crawls on hands and knees. And you look for a spark in the ash heap of humanity to give you hope. And Officer Marshmallow is not making it any easier. I'm reading, minding my business, because outside is more problems than being in your cell. So he walks by the gallery holding his keys so I won't hear him. He wants to catch somebody doing something illegal. And he tiptoes through the gallery. <laughs> Officer Marshmallow, I mean, uh, Officer Murphy, what? Goes, oh, I'm just checking. Everything okay in there? Yeah, everything's okay. I'm just reading. Okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. So this is what I have to deal with. It's a game, almost. Cat and mouse. And so I'm so disappointed when I'm denied justice in 2004. But what I do is I start writing letters. I keep writing letter after letter until I get new attorneys. By 2005, my story becomes a national story. Aired for an hour. And people start writing what they can do across America. They start rallying. Free Fernando, free Fernando, free Fernando. In front of the prosecutor's office. The New York Times placed my case front page. And the prosecutor, for the first time, unknown to any of us, starts investigating. Because now I have politicians saying, we got to get this case investigated. Otherwise, we're going to go and tell the governor to do something about it. So they begin investigating and they don't tell us. We don't know this. So meanwhile, I get a new defense team. And this defense team, led by another lawyer who becomes a lawyer in her late 40s also, gets me a team of lawyers from Washington, D.C., New York law firms, some of the best in America, as well as New Jersey. And they all come. And the reason why I get this new lawyer is because Marianne DeBarry, the lawyer who had been fighting, me, fighting with me to help prove the truth for so long, now has cancer. And it seems like she's going to die. So she can't even get out of bed anymore. And it's a victory because there's a journalist involved who actually looks like Professor Putzka. <laughs> so he's like my friend. And he's coming, and he's writing story, which is why I like him so much. <laughs> because he reminds me of the journalist who fought for my case from 1991 up until then and up until now. And his name is Claude Sonic, who started writing about my case. And it's a victory because now we go to court and we have a new judge. We have a new judge, an Italian-American jurist called Justice John Cataldo. And he says, we're going to allow the prosecutor to investigate. And I believe it was for purposes of them hanging themselves even more. Because throughout this investigation, they send their own officers to investigate the key leads that Ephraim Lopez told the police from the very beginning about Wu Lu. And what they find is what we already tried to share some of it at least, with the court, and the court didn't do anything about it. And that was that Wu Lu 
was actually Luis Munoz, a real person who lived around the West 90s and was part of that group of 60 to 70 Latinos attacking about 30 blacks in that crazy fight. And that Wu Lu, Luis Munoz, had left the state of New York right after the murder. Now, why would he leave the state of New York after the murder? Are you hiding something? Now, he's living under a false name. And as he goes from state to state, as if he's running from something, gee, I wonder what? He's getting arrested for different things, drug possession, forgery, any number of things he's getting arrested for. And so the prosecution doesn't show us this. What I love about German law is that prosecutors are not given the same discretion as American prosecutors are given. The judge, as you know, is in charge of the whole case. And he prepares the questions and the, the, the procedures, unlike American lawyers who prepare uh, the witnesses and everything like that. The judge has a big role in this. In German law, juveniles are not charged as adults. In American law, they are. Ephraim Lopez, had he not been charged or had the risk of being charged as an adult with 25 years to life, Perhaps, you know, we could have had a situation in which he would have continued trying to tell the truth as he tried to. But the prosecutor used his discretion, used his power, which should be controlled to give him that deal because he could. And so he also did something that perhaps under German law would have protected me. When my trial began, he gave what was called disclosure, meaning boxes of evidence, in which there was more evidence of my innocence, but it was given right when my jury began to get situated. I know in Germany, you have no jury and you have no grand jury, but in America, we do. And as a result of this late disclosure, meaning you turned over this evidence for my lawyer to inspect too late when my trial began, it created a big disadvantage for me. So now we're hoping that all of this and more is going to make a difference in my case when we go before Justice John Cataldo. And this case begins in 2009. I am ordered for my 11th appeal at the 11th hour, after 11 witnesses testify, to stand before Justice John Cataldo. And it's a victory, not only that I'm there, but also the fact that I have rejected a deal with the devil, so to speak. Faust, Goethe's famous story of the scholar who gets bored with life and makes a deal with the devil an agent of the devil, Mephistopheles, is a situation applicable to my case because I reject a deal with the devil in exchange for getting out of prison in a week. The prosecution says to me, through my lawyers, if you accept and plead guilty to a lesser form of murder, then you can go home in a week. Now, I want to go home. You know, I'm missing my wife's cooking. She has all these good recipes. I don't know where she gets it from, and it's not even from a book. She just got it in her head. It's like she has a shelf of all these recipes. And she just picks one up. Boop, pie. Boop, pizza. Boop, special pork chop. You know, all these recipes. And I miss that. I want to eat. I want to play with my kids. We got three kids now. Three little beautiful kids. I have a son now. I want to be a dad. I want to throw ball and catch with him. I want to do things that a father does with his children. And I want to go home. And people are telling me, Fernando, if I was given that deal, I would take it. You should take it. And I tell them, but are you innocent, man? Are you innocent? 
No, I'm not innocent. No. Then maybe you don't have anything further to live for. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche spoke about that he who has a why to live can bear with any how. I had to bear it. I had to bear with the fact that getting justice also meant dying for it. It meant the fact that I would possibly die if I lost this procedure because a parole board, a governing body who wants a person to say they're guilty or say I'm sorry before they're released from prison would want me to do the same. How could I do that? How could I say I'm sorry if I had nothing to do with this? So I rejected that willing to die. And so when I go to court before this judge, I'm very scared, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that the evil in this case, evil, E-V-I-L, has been turned around in a way to spell live. L-I-V-E, that I will live, not exist in prison as an innocent man. I'm coming home, and I got to believe that. I got to use my faith in God to touch upon the supernatural, to use a power which seems that would make the impossible possible. I have to believe that. I have to walk that staircase, that dark staircase, where it seems that you don't even know where you're walking to, but you're walking, you're walking, you're strutting. Because you have to believe. You have to have hope. Your body is not one without a skeleton, but one that stands erect, ready to tell the truth, ready to die for it. And that's exactly what I'm ready to do. For love. For love. And so I go before the courtroom. And I stand there. And I'm scared still. Yeah. Yeah, I'm scared. And I stand. And the courtroom is so full of people. There's all attorneys in the past who have lost, hoping, man, if, if we didn't win, let somebody else win. Let this team. And the prosecutor is there. He has a toupee. You know, he got like his hair. He looks like Richard Gere a little bit, the actor. And he's like, like he's ready to pose for pictures as if he might win or something. I don't know. But he's just standing there. And I look at my, my mother, my father. I look at other witnesses. I look at my wife. You know, and they just give me a look like, be strong. Whatever happens, we're with you. And the judge silences everybody. Silencio. And everybody's quiet. It's almost like you could hear a pin drop. You could hear the... And he says, the case of the people of the state of New York versus Fernando Bermudez will now receive a decision. And I sit there like my knees are shaking. I'm like, oh man. Man, no more prison, man. It's no more. And he says, I hereby declare the defendant, Fernando Bermudez, factually innocent. And everybody starts clapping. And you hear a, ah. And I start crying. I start crying like a newborn baby as my life flashes by. I'm just seeing pictures of me being a little boy, of me going to high school and graduating, of me being with my wife and, and kids, of me just being free. And I start crying and I'm like a new world baby and indeed I am. Because after the judge says that the prosecutor knew and should have known that he was rely upon perjured testimony with the use of Ephraim Lopez. And after he says that my identification procedures were illegal and should not have occurred. And after he says that the state of New York, for the first time, had admitted that his star witness, Ephraim Lopez, who we know as Pinocchio, had lied that my case is a disgrace to New York City. Who knows who committed the crime and should pursue it? In fact, this judge, unlike any of the other judges that I was who my case was before, whether I saw them or not. No other individual, including the detective who was in charge of this homicide case, Detective Daniel Mazanova. My case was his second of his young career. His first case was overturned 
And the other person, the first case, within a few months, he was also proven innocent. None of them apologized. But Justice John Cataldo apologized and said, I hope for you a much better future. And so the handcuffs come off and I'm crying and I'm just amazed at the world. I come out to the world and the world has changed after over 6,700 days in prison. It feels like someone took a plastic bag, which I was breathing in for all those years, and now I could breathe fresh air, even though there was pollution and everything like that. And it didn't matter, because I was a free man now. And outside the courtroom, people were waving Fernando Bermudez's Innocence t-shirts. It was a celebration when we got to our neighborhood, my Dominican Republican neighborhood, where the whole street was closed down and people were chanting in Spanish, Justicia, verdad, libertad. Justicia, verdad, libertad. Justice, truth, freedom. It was a victory not just for me, but for my whole Dominican community and so many other people. Because here was an individual who they were fighting for justice together and who saw my mother suffer for so many years. And my father drinking in the streets, drunk, telling people my son is innocent. This is a case that affected my whole family and made us all suffer. And so I come out into this world and I'm blinking in reality. Wow, the world has changed. The cell phones, which were this big, were now this small. And people are talking to themselves. I'm like, and they're in their cars talking. I'm like, what is going on here? It's Bluetooth technology. I realize, you know, fashion has changed. I mean, I used to be a b-boy. I told you, you know, graffiti and all that, you know, and I used to dress. Now, I don't know what, what the style is anymore. And somebody throws me a pair of jeans. Catch them. Skinny jeans. I say, okay, that's new. So... I get behind the thing in my house with the oh, reporters, everybody in the house, and I get in, I want to come out with my new skinny jeans. I want to get rid of this prison clothing, you know? And so, I put them on, or I try to, <laughs> and I come it on, I got a big butt. <laughs> I don't know, it don't go on my, my, my big Dominican butt, my wife says, I don't know. <laughs> Is that it? No, they don't even fit my leg, you know? So I put them on, and then I, I hop out, and I go, these jeans don't fit. They go, those are skinny jeans. That's the style, dude. <laughs> and he got the little Bluetooth thing and the thing is blinging. The little blue light, bling, 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 as he talks and smiles. And I'm like, nah, 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 nah. These things feel like leotards. I might as well be like a Mikhail Barishnikov and, you know, just do a dance because I can't move with these things, much less dance, of course. So I get a size of skinnier jeans that are not so skinny. I put those on. And then I start eating. Oh, man, food is such a big thing. Ladies and gentlemen, the type of food they serve in prison is horrible. That alone is torture. The type of food they serve is like, for example, on a given day, what's called mystery meat. It's like a hockey puck of beef. And you don't know what it is, really, because it's so burnt. And you got to kind of eat it. You know, it's almost like you could be a discus thrower and throw it. That's how it is. You know, and the food is horrible, so horrible that Rasputin would probably be difficult, will have trouble digesting the food. And so I start eating and I'm eating and I can't stop eating. It almost feels like I'm going to float away. And then I go to my park, my park, Inwood Park, where I grew up. A park where throughout elementary school, I was the person who led games of run, catch, and kiss. <laughs> a person who had dreams and hopes and dreams of becoming a geologist. Where I would go with my little, my little helmet with the, with the light. You know, I just had this idea of I wanted to study the earth. It was a very innocent type of thing. And I would pick rocks. So from one side to the b-boy, I was also like a nerd, you know? And that's okay, because I was developing a good rock collection. 
as a result. And it was this beautiful park, a park where one day while digging for rocks, I heard an unfortunate movement and it, it, it turned out to be devil worshipers and we got chased, oh, we're out of here, you know. And so in the park, I'm running. I'm a free man and I'm running for the first time in my life, unlike prison life. In prison, I used to run for miles just so I could stop my hands from shaking. In prison, I used to get nervous because I was stressed out. I was very sad and depressed and I used to have to run so I could just sleep. It's almost like you exhaust yourself to sleep. I didn't care if I'm running in the crowded yard and people are saying, run, Forrest, run. And I'm like, eh, you know. And so I didn't care. I'm going to run because I got to survive. So I was a runner and I'm still a runner to this day. So now I'm running. I'm running and I'm free and I'm crying. I'm looking at that Hudson River. You know, it's like perhaps the equivalent of uh, what you would call in your country, at least in this area, the Danube, right? The, the song that uh, uh, Strauss made famous. The waltz, you know? That river, right? Blue Danube, the song, well, the Hudson River was my river, and I'm running and I'm just a happy person. But ladies and gentlemen, what I also realized as I started getting used to society again is that I had problems. I had problems. You would think that after getting out of prison, everything is good, the fairy tale ends, the end. No, 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 no. Open up the book. There's more. There's more to the story. And that is adjusting to society in ways that still give me problems. In ways that I just can't walk with a nice, bright sun in front of me, like Charlie Chaplin. And wave. No, 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 no. This is not a movie. This is reality. I started waking up after prison, feeling like I was still a prisoner, being counted in a prison cell. Because every day, you got to wake up at 5.30 in the morning and stand up. Otherwise, you get in trouble by Officer Marshmallow. And I had to get used to feeling like a free man again. It didn't feel correct for me to hold money in my pocket, because in prison you can't have money. It didn't feel correct for me to even walk around the street walking our family dog, a little cute doggy, 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 who looked like the Wizard of Oz, Toto. I felt strange as an over 200 pound man walking a dog, but hey, when you're free, you do everything. You can. And so I had to get used to all of that, crossing the street. The street is just right there. My wife said, come, 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 come. And I, I see the cars and it look, it just, I was confused. I didn't know how to drive anymore. I had to get my driver's license again. I had to stop washing my underwears in the shower, because in prison, that's the custom, you wash your underwear in the shower when you're taking a shower with a bunch of people, which is uncomfortable enough. I had to stop all of that. I had to get used to the idea that I was a free man and I didn't have to say yes sir and yes ma'am to every teenager who worked in McDonald's. I didn't have to do that. Yet I was used to seeing people in authority and even a person from Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's, for me, represented authority. So many issues, ladies and gentlemen, and that's why I see a psychologist. I see a psychologist to help me in my adjustment in life. And I need it because getting justice means that I have to continue fighting for justice for others. That's why today I'm in your beautiful country. I'm in your beautiful country as part of being, you could say, a positive Johnny Appleseed of hope, planting seeds in different cities, planting seeds to grow, to put the knowledge of you that what happened to me should not happen to anyone else, and that all of you, as future police officers, lawyers, judges, and any number of professionals, all can make a difference in this beautiful country of over 90 million people. An economic leader of all Europe, and the largest country, I think, in all of Europe. All of you are being trained as professionals to make a difference. 
And that's why I have to continue training myself. The seven cities that I have been privileged to speak at in Germany is an opportunity to meet all of you, to shake your hands, you know, to shake your hand, to shake your hand, and to shake your hand, and to let you know that in all of you, I see a mirror. I see a reflection of humanity that is so beautiful and important to save another life. To make a good decision as you progress with the skills that you're earning at this beautiful school, Bavaria, you know, Passau, this whole beautiful campus, the beautiful river here, which I want to put my toe in. <laughs> I'm do it. And so all of this means that together, after I leave you today, we are partners. We are partners. We are partners in a struggle for justice because getting justice means continuing justice for others and giving hope as we continue training ourselves. I just earned my bachelor's degree straight A's and I had to work very hard for that. Now I'm going for my master's and then my doctor's degree while I decide whether or not to pursue law instead. I have to figure that out. But as I figure it out, I'm going to continue telling my story in the way I did recently in Rome, Italy, where I spoke at the Roman Colosseum after abolishing the death penalty in Connecticut. I, my wife and I worked very hard to help abolish the death penalty in Connecticut, along with many people. We just small people that worked, but we worked hard. And as a result, I got honored to go to Italy, Naples, Salerno, other places, and speak. And I spoke at the Roman Colosseum, and I was crying as it was all dark. And then when they honored Connecticut for having abolished this death penalty, the lights came on. And then some music came on. You know, it sounded like, like, like uh, that movie from the chariot races or something. Like a chariot was about to come out from the sky. Chariots of fire. Ding, 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 ding. Ding, 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 ding. I was like, wow. I was just amazed. And it's important because the death penalty is a problem in America. Thank goodness that Europe doesn't have the death penalty. So congratulations on that. But America has a long fight ahead of itself. 143 innocent people have been released from death row in America. Very close at times to being killed. 303 have been released through DNA based exonerations, with a total number of over a thousand since 1989 until the present released as innocent people from both death row and throughout non-DNA related problems, like mine. And experts estimate that 5% of the 2.3 million incarceration rate in America is likely innocent. 5%, 5%, that means that we have tens of thousands of innocent people in America today. One conservative judge says, well, I don't think it's that high. I think it's oh, 1%. Well, judge, even if it's 1%, that means we still have one too many. So it's a problem that we have. America is growing obese with its incarceration. We lead incarceration in America more than any other country in the world. If not, we're at the top. Germany has a very low incarceration rate, even though it's, of course, a lower population. So the law is a tool to help improve the imperfections of our imperfect criminal justice system. And that's why I continue speaking. After here, I go to Japan in October to speak. We go to India, where I promised my wife she's going to ride on an elephant. <laughs> we're going everywhere in the world, and we're going to tell our story to save people, innocent people, anywhere in the world, because no innocent person should be in prison for a crime they didn't commit. It's a human rights and public safety violation, which means that once an innocent person is incarcerated, the guilty person is outside. And he can knock on your door, he can knock on our door, he can knock on your door. 
And that is a problem. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in affirming the pledge to do better. That getting justice means using our skills and knowledge and our belief that humanity is worth it. Because when you do, it will be better than a paycheck. It will be better than not doing anything at all and standing by and saying, wow, I should have done something. Join me in this. Join me in exercising love for humanity. Because when I leave today, I'm taking all of you in my heart with the beautiful faces and the beautiful memories that we share today at the University of Passau. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>